Hi everyone, I'm David Turner and this is Om Nom Nash. I'm going to be telling you about a board game called Om Nom Nom and how I wrote an AI to solve it. Uh, so first I have to tell you how to play the board game. So you've got a board that looks like this. It's got nine sections and this tells you that cats eat mice and mice eat cheese and wolves eat rabbits and rabbits eat carrots and hedgehogs eat frogs. I looked this up, this is actually true. Hedgehogs eat frogs uh, and frogs eat flies. Uh, and then you roll some dice, um, and the dice are only on the bottom uh, two-thirds of the board, and they tell you what resources are going to be available to eat during the game, uh, in addition to your opponent's uh, cards. So here the green player has played a uh, cat card, and the red and blue players unfortunately have played mouse cards. So they're going to get zero points because their uh, mice are going to get eaten before they can do anything. But the cat's going to get four points, the green player, one for surviving, two for the two players' mice, and one for the uh, mice on the die. Uh, so everyone's just gonna play their cards simultaneously and then reveal them. That's how Amnonom is played. Uh, so now we have to discuss game theory, uh, which, is how we're <laughs> which is how we're going to solve this. Um, so you've probably all played this game with the rock and the paper and the scissors. Um, and let's just break this down a little so that it's easier to read. So here we see that the column player has played rock and the row player has played scissors and the um, rock player is going to win and the scissors player is going to lose. But I guess since game theory is a branch of mathematics, we probably have to use numbers instead of win and lose. So we'll call a win two, a loss uh, one, zero, sorry, and a tie one. Uh, and then, so this is the whole matrix with the numbers in it. Um, and in this sort of game, there are two kinds of strategies. There's pure strategies and there's mixed strategies. Uh, you're familiar with the pure strategies. Uh, those are the ones where you just choose one thing and you always go with it. Um, <laughs> And then there's the mixed strategies, which are, in this particular case, how you actually want to play. You have some percentage of each of the uh, options. Uh, and so we all know when we're actually playing rock, paper, scissors that we do not choose the good old rock strategy. Uh, and the reason behind this is this thing called a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and a Nash equilibrium is a situation where no one can do better by unilaterally changing strategies. So if you're playing the always choose rock strategy and I'm playing the mixed strategy, we are not in a Nash equilibrium because I can do better by choosing the always choose paper strategy. But if we're both in that uh, even you know, one third, one third, one third strategy, then there's no need to, uh, to switch strategies. None of us can do any better. This is it. Uh, so let's look at an example from Om Nom Nom and see how we can have a Nash equilibrium. So this is a board where there's just a couple of pieces of cheese on the bottom, but actually they're red cheeses, so they're, they're four point, uh, points worth of cheese. Um, and so uh, I've got a mouse and a cat, and you've got a mouse and a cat. Uh, and this is what our payoff matrix looks like. If we both play our cats, our cats are gonna bounce and we're gonna each get one point because our cats survive. If we both play mice, we'll get three points because we'll split up this uh, six, four points per, worth of cheese between us plus the one for our uh, mice surviving. If you play a cat and I play a mouse, then I'm in trouble uh, and so on, vice versa. Um, so where in here is the equilibrium between these cats and these mice? Um, so one option is we could both play cats and one option is we could both play mice. Maybe there's some like middle thing. Uh, and it turns out that actually all three are equilibria. Um, so if we're both playing cats, I have no reason to ever splash in a mouse because my mouse is just gonna get eaten. Uh, and interestingly, if we're both playing mice, I have no reason to put in a cat because I'll get the two points for eating your thing, but I could get the three points for having the cheese. But something is, something is not quite right here. Um, and uh, <laughs> that is that in a two-player om nom nom, any point that you get is a point I didn't get. Right? Me getting a point is, is um, you know, I'd be just as happy if you lost the point. And if we both get a point, I'm, I'm indifferent, right? So what? My goal is to beat you. Um, so here's what the actual payoff matrix looks like with the, the zero-sum game thing. But something is, is still not quite right. Um, because Om Nom Nom is actually multi-round. After you've played your first card from your hand, you evaluate that, and you put it aside, then you play the next card from your hand, uh, and so on, until you're out of cards in your hand. Um, so your actual score is uh, whatever it is for this round, plus the rest of the game. Um, and in this case, if my cat eats your mouse this turn, then all I've got is a mouse left, and you only got a cat left, so your cat's gonna eat my mouse, and so the, zero. Um, so it, it's not always this boring, in, in answer to the question. This is, uh, there, there actually is some interest to the game, right? So let's consider a slightly different situation here. Um, so here there's just one mouse die that's been rolled, um, and um, you've got uh, a cat and uh, a wolf, and I've got a cat and a mouse. Uh, and now I'm in trouble, right? Because your cat can eat my mouse, but my mouse can't eat your wolf. And so uh, it, it's sort of a bad scene for me. Um, and so I think I like, on average, if I play this perfectly, I can get like negative three quarters of a point. You're gonna get positive three quarters of a point. And, and this turns out to be the equilibrium. Uh, mostly I wanna play the cat first. And first, because once the mouse gets eaten off the board, that's, that's the end of it. Uh, but I gotta splash in the, the mouse first uh, occasionally just to keep you honest. Um, I, and so let's talk about how we can do this sort of search to find out uh, what our good strategy is. Uh, and first let's look at sort of the size of the problem, 
right? So on the first play, uh, there are these 36, well, I'm gonna call them game states, but possible plays, right? I have six cards in my hand from the top six rows of this board. You have six cards in your hand, and we have these, these combinations between them. Uh, and then for the second one, we have uh, 25, because we've got five cards left, and so on. Um, and um, so if we add this up, our total sp state space, um, right, we've got one, we've got the initial state of the game, right, plus the, our 36 possibilities for the second one. But then there's the 36 possibilities times the 25 possibilities for the third one, right? And so it actually gets pretty large here. Uh, there's like 600 and something thousand of them. Um, which, so computing the Nash equilibrium itself is uh, outside the scope of this talk, uh, and it's, it's kind of difficult. Um, and so for at least my Python program, this takes like several minutes to evaluate, which is not like great if you're trying to actually play this thing. Uh, so we want to figure out how to reduce this state space somewhat. Um, and so one way we can do it is by player symmetry. So um, if we evaluate the situation where um, I've played a cat and you've played a mouse, right, we don't need to evaluate the situation where you've played a cat and I've played a mouse, everything else being held equal, right? Because we already have the results and we can just flip them. Um, and that actually reduces our state space uh, a lot. And, but we, we, can, we can do better. We can use simple memoization. Um, so if we just keep track, say, okay, so in the past, after some number of plays, the board looked like this, and your hand looked like that, and my hand looked like that, uh, then next time we're in that same situation, which can happen, um, uh, then we can just use our, our result that we computed last time. Uh, and you notice that we have a little uh, tilde here. It's about 14,000. Um, this depends on the exact layout of the board, right? Because if uh, how many possible distinct states there are depend on how many dice get rolled. If there's just no flies, right, that reduces the, the pos number of possible states and increases the value of our memoization. But we can actually do better than that, right? If we take our memoization with player symmetry, so now uh, we remember the situation with you had the cat and I had the mouse, right? Now if we just swap those two. Uh, but the, the really cool thing is we can actually save a little bit more, right, by using these equivalence classes. So you notice that the three columns of the board are more or less the same. Uh, and so if we use our keys by canonicalizing cleverly the game state to instead of talking about cats and mice, talking about in general there is some predator, right? And there are three instances of its prey available and six instances of its meta prey, right? Uh, with taking into account everyone's cards in their hands and the state of the board, um, we can not knock another like thousand-ish states off, uh, which gets us down to like a few seconds. Uh, and that, that's, I think, fast enough to keep us from ever having to play this game. <laughs> um, so uh, unfortunately, there are a few problems with this AI. Uh, so in game theory, in general, your goal is to get the highest score. Um, and uh, usually this is a good thing, right? Game theorists are happy if you win, so long as I win too. Uh, but for a game, it's zero sum. Again, I, I want to win. Um, and so sometimes there's a case where like, the best thing you can do is you can get a solid four every time, right? But there's another option where you can get seven sometimes, but most of the time you're gonna get zero. Um, and so this is less good than the four all the time, unless, you're six points down, in which case you really gotta throw that Hail Mary pass, uh, and unfortunately our AI is not going to find the Hail Mary. Um, and so, I, how much time do I have left? Two minutes, great. So since I have an extra two minutes, um, uh, oh my God, right. Uh, uh, I can go into a little digression here. Um, so uh, imagine uh, rock, paper, scissors, right, but rock pays out double when you win, so instead of paying out um, two points, I guess it pays out three points, right, so that's the, points over the tie, right. Um, so you end up in this sort of funny situation, right, where you want, want to play rock most of the time, but you don't want to play it all the time, because you play it all the time, I'm just gonna play paper all the time. Uh, and it turns out, this is one of the things that I was using to test out my, uh, my AI, that you want to play rock five twelfths of the time. So whenever anyone offers to play this game with you for money, now you know what you're supposed to do. Um, and uh, since I, I do have another couple of minutes, um, so if we look at this situation that we had back in the uh, original slide, right, where we had, um, this set of uh, dice, which turns out to contain um, no rabbits and no, uh, it does contain, uh, yeah, sorry, it contains no rabbits and it contains no carrots. Um, so 10% of the time in this situation, you wanna play a rabbit first. Because if you play your rabbit first, you know, well, the opponent's probably not gonna play a wolf, so it'll probably survive, so I'll just get that free one point and have my rabbit safe, right? You never wanna play a wolf first. You could say, well, maybe I've got that 10% chance of catching their rabbit. Yeah, you do. But instead, you could play like a uh, frog first, eat the flies, and have your frog be safe from the hedgehog later. Um, so uh, there's this computation actually comes out with some really cool results, and uh, unfortunately I lost the slide for that, but uh, that is the, um, 
uh, that is Amnam Nash. Uh, thank you. Uh, and a special thank you from Semaphore. You can follow her on Twitter along with her brother Mutex at Big Flutes.